thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. And uh, uh, I'm Monika Stowiecka. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Warsaw. Uh, I'm an archaeologist and a historian of art. And uh, in July this year, I defended my PhD dissertation that was partly devoted to the ways of presenting current paradigmatic theories uh, in archaeological museums. So the vast of my work was devoted to digital media and museums. Uh, this was actually not, <laughs> not my wish to deal with all those digital tools as presented in, in, in different museums. However, as, as, as a Pole living in Poland and observing what is currently going on in, in Polish museums, I was somehow pushed uh, into the digital realm of archaeology. So nowadays in Poland, we experience a huge boom of multimedia exhibitions. Our museums are not getting extra funds if they don't, don't prove that they are using, to quote, innovative means to improve the exhibition, transfer of knowledge, or communication with the visitors. As an effect of this digital preference, everyone is turning to multimedia displays. They look new, progressive, attractive. But there is a trap. Those effects are very often superficial. New technologies are being quickly replaced with newer ones, so as a result, new museums are quickly becoming old ones, providing nothing but outdated technologies. According to Tara Copleston and Daniel Dune, multi multimedia exhibitions didn't introduce a new model of display. The narratives are copy-pasted from the analog schemes, so the great digital revolution ended rather with unfulfilled dreams and expectations. In my presentation, I would like to discuss why, why fallacies took over the uh, digital media and museums, and at the same time offer a way to overcome this impasse. My hypothesis is based on the assumption that there is no strong theoretical foundation, uh, foundation for digital media on archaeological exhibitions, thus their application often ends with superficial meaning, bland slogans, or simply a technological showcase. At the same time, I believe that digital media and technologies have still much to offer to museums and can be used to create meanings and inspire our imagination only while grounded on a coherent vision. To illustrate this belief, I will discuss the technique of imagineering in archaeological museums, a conceptual and theoretical framework inspired by te technology studies, medical and biohumanities, and design studies. Imagineering will be a way to understand museums' digital media as means to stimulate visitors' imagination. So in 2017, uh, Manuela Rosini, a scholar representing post-humanism, coined the term imagineering as an explicit connection of imagination and engineering, obviously. Imagineering is an effect of an interaction between fictional approaches and a conception of engineering practice. To imagineer then is to deploy the various versions of design and expression that help us to use our imagination. Rosini referred to ways in which this term can help with conceptualizing technological bodies within contextual networks and thus, in a broader perspective, anticipating the future. She wrote, rather sooner than later, cyborgs and other hybrids, androids and technologically enhanced humans will people the earth and maybe other planets. Imagineered in scientific texts, such embodied subjects can be seen as cultural prefigurations of future human beings in the real world. How can her theory be applied in museum studies? How can this term be of use in archaeological museum context? First of all, it needs to be stated that multimedia archaeological exhibitions didn't gain a lot of theoretical interest in contrast to ways of using digital toolbox in archaeology. The shift from the spade work to screen work in archaeology was indeed a radical revolution that has influenced the way of practicing the study of the past. 
However, a total metamorphosis that archaeology has gone through the recent years did not provide the discipline with a new, coherent, theoretical framework. Even though many of the researchers in the digital and cyber field announced the race of digital culture or digital ecosystems, the significant shift in data gathering, data representation, and the afterlife of data, uh, so the uh, digital, virtual, and cyber imagery, did not contribute to the formulation of a new theory that could respond to the digital and cyber advances. Quickly developing technologies should create open fora for the co-production of pasts that matter now and for visions of future community. However, nothing suggests that this is a common thinking in digital and cyber archaeology. The reflexive approach is rarely encountered, even if the examples of the best practices come from the top world archaeological sites. A kind of digital consciousness is generally rare across the discipline and diverse archaeological projects. Many researchers notice this severe lack that leads simply to meaningless techno-optimism or even techno-fetishism. Jeremy Huget, a prominent figure in the digital archaeological theory, argues that currently this area is under-theorized, under-represented and undervalued. Yet it is an increasingly fundamental to the way in which we arrive at an understanding of the past. His calls for a meaningful dialogue about the intervening technologies and their influence on the outputs are left almost unanswered. Huget emphasized that archaeology has the best position among humanities to investigate and understand the implications, transformations, and reper repercussions of digital technologies. However, it is rarely happening. The reason may lay in technofetishism and technocracy, as suggested by many, but also in the digital culture itself. As Roberto Szymanowski points out in his book on the seduction on and betrayal of digital technologies, the general absence of coherent theory in digital studies is striking. I, found this, uh, I find this theoretical impasse in digital archaeology remarkable and affecting the way we use digital media in archaeological museums. I strongly agree with Alien Hooper Greenhill, Stephanie Moser, and other scholars who promote the belief that museums mirror the, the shape of uh, academic discipline. So thus, I would say that weak multimedia displays reflect the un uh, under-theorized realm of digital archaeology in academy. However, given the advantages of using multimedia in museums, maybe we should not be worried about the lack of elaborate theories. For sure, digital media and museums fulfill a demand for a participatory, inclusive, and democratic museum that is open to all. We need to agree that they offer a peak experience by providing entry to unreachable places and facilitating fascinating travels through time. The museum enriched with digital tools fulfills the demand for the access broadly construed. For sure, um, they promise us that we are able to present the invisible. So virtual means assist where the imagination falls short. Moreover, these techniques tend to actively engage the senses and therefore provide the audience with a richer experience of the past. Digital exhibits uh, may be easily enriched with new content and supplemented with the most recent scientific results. In the case of archaeology, this is obviously of the vital importance. Furthermore, visualizing the data also raises the issue of aestheticizing of the past. This may seem trivial in the context of museum studies, but the problem of aesthetics is rarely addressed by researchers working in either archaeology or museum studies. Augmented with thoughtful lightning effects, digital displays operate in a realm of mystery that engages, intrigues, and very often seduces. And lastly, multimedia tools are very consistent in their complexity of design. Each detail of a tablet experience, movie, or educational game seems to be very carefully considered. 
Furthermore, colorful assets and complex simulations and visualizations create a substantial counterweight to traditional means of presenting artifacts in glass cases and alongside, alongside lengthy texts. Having listed all those advantages, I should stop and ask, what is then wrong with those wonderful technologies? I would say that in the most cases, they offer us products that are ready at hand. Museums that decide to replace artifacts with digital exhibits are taking away from us the chance to imagine the past. Everything is given. Everything is already imagined by someone else. An archaeologist in the best case, but mostly by graphic designers, programmers, IT specialists, uh, curators, um, artists sometimes, but very rarely. And what I always uh, found the most attractive ar uh, about archaeology was something called by Michael Shanks, the archaeological imagination. So he defines it as a creative impulse lying at the heart of archaeology, but also embedded in many cultural dispositions, discourses and institutions commonly associated with modernity. The archaeological imagination invites us to recreate the world behind the ruin in the land, to reanimate the people behind the shirt of antique pottery. The archaeological imagination is rooted in a sensibility, a pervasive set of attitudes towards traces and remains, towards memory, time and temporality, the fabric of history. How then can those two instances, technology and imagination, meet in the archaeological museum. So, on the 6th of March 2018, Parisians walking along the streets encountered an extraordinary view. Many of the well-known fragmented or broken classical sculptures decorating the French capital were equipped in prostheses. One could see a copy of the famous statue of Venus from Milo standing at the subway station and wearing two grey cyborgish limbs. The sculpture of Alexandre Combatant by Charles François Leboeuf, displayed in the Jardin de Tuileries, was fitted with an arm prosthesis. Other park sculptures, like the scene of Nessus abducting Dianira by Laurent Marquez, was supplemented with a prosthetic rising arm. This is the one. This intriguing and thought-provoking intervention was prepared, by, was prepared by the Heresy Group, a commercial agency based in Paris for the Handicap International. The action was aimed to raise the awareness of the global needs for prosthetics. About 100 million people around the world need artificial limbs, and to answer this pressing social problem, a French non-profit organization developed a pilot program to, del to deliver 3D printed limbs to remote regions and conflict zones. This powerful program, driven by the development of 3D technologies, has been already introduced in Togo, Madagascar or Syria. The way of communicating <coughs> such an important socio-political issue was truly innovative and deeply appealing. 3D printed gray and blue artificial prostheses coupled with a, with a bit decayed sculptures of ancient and classical look created a powerful imagery that ruled the media all over the world. The effort of the heresy group was awarded with two Cannes Lions, two uh, Clio Advertising and two London International Awards given for the innovation and creative excellence in advertising design and communication. Photos of Venus of Milo or Alexandre Combatant were said to be um, striking photos of the week that raised the awareness uh, in the world. Mute, silent, and sometimes very familiar statues, they are, not be they are not believed to offer anything else than aesthetic pleasure. They were animated and me made meaningful thanks to new technologies. Comments on the Body Can Wait campaign were very positive and press emphasized the creative potential of this original intervention. And why am I showing this to you? Because the same 3D technologies, exactly the same 3D technologies, are currently ruling museums and archaeological sites around the world. But rarely or ever 
Their implementation equals with creating persuasive and novel meaning. Can archaeology learn its lesson from the Body Can't Wait campaign introduced in Paris? Projecting those statues in a museum setting, I would emphasize their ability to use the creative potential of technologies in reconstructing, supplementing and reviving old originals instead of replacing them. At the same time, inviting visitors to envision other semi-digital pasts. I, I argue that those interesting couplings of historic monuments and the latest technologies set perfect circumstances for imagineering in museums, entangling together technologies and imagination in the service of archaeology. Thank you very much.